I first met a woman named Kate sitting in front of a store called Glotmart, a kosher grocery store, a dirty kosher grocery store, at the intersection of Pico Boulevard and Shenandoah Street in Los Angeles, California. From time to time, people would walk by Kate and drop coins in her paper cup, or they would bring her a bag of snacks from the store. But most people walked right by, looked away, as I did at first, trying to hide my discomfort. The Pico Robertson neighborhood of Los Angeles, where Rachel and I lived, was home to an eclectic community of Jews. It's busy, it's crowded, it's full of grit and car horns. The bustling city soundtrack woke us up many a night. Fire engines, police cars, helicopters, impatient drivers, other noises accented the city rhythm too. A family arguing across the street in their window. Two men from the shul next door shouting at each other in Hebrew or Farsi. The squeaky wheels of a homeless man's shopping cart. And every so often, we startled awake from a woman's mournful cries. Or sometimes a shouting manic monologue coming from the middle of the street. That was Kate, too. Having witnessed the episodic symptoms of her illness from my second floor balcony, my instinct was often to steer clear. I pushed my son's stroller past the grocery store in the early morning hours, and that was the extent of our interaction. Until one day, walking by, she smiled at me like a friend and said, wow, your son is growing so big. I stopped and we made some small talk. We learned each other's names. She was thoughtful and kind. She loved kids. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development reports that 45% of adults without housing in America also suffer from a mental illness. Schizophrenia, bipolar, anxiety disorders, unshakable addictions, these are the most prevalent forms of mental illness that plague people without homes in our country, without houses in our country. We recognize these individuals every day on the streets of Los Angeles, less so here in Beechwood, but just drive downtown. For many of us, when we hear the term mental illness, we picture somebody like Kate, a man or woman covered in the grime of a city, struggling in public view, a human being we might pity or ignore. We often turn away because we're afraid, because we think we aren't at risk ourselves, because we're in control of our lives and we resist using drugs, because it's too hard to imagine ourselves in her shoes. This could not be farther from the truth. Helping people who struggle with mental illness in our streets should of course be a priority, but we miss the breadth of this human crisis when we associate emotional disorders with just one segment of our struggling population. Individuals living on the streets who have a mental illness represent about 0.1% of the U.S. population. But in each of the past three years, 20%, or one in five adults in the United States, suffered from mental illness. In truth, 50% of all lifetime mental illnesses begin by the age of 14, and 75% by the age of 24. One out of every six youth between the ages of six and 17 experienced a mental health disorder this year. One in five adults, one in six youth. Long before we knew anything about a COVID pandemic in 2020, long before that, we faced an epidemic of mental illness in our country. Mental illness doesn't just exist on the street corners or in hospital psych wards. It is common, it's painful, it's isolating. And sometimes it's unimaginably tragic, right in our home, own homes and in our lives. Just consider for a moment the sad reality that suicide is the second leading cause of death among people ages 10 through 34, and the 10th overall for adults. In our community, in every community, we've lost sons and daughters, brothers and sisters and parents. We've mourned for them in our sanctuaries and in our schools, 
in our hallways of our, cla- uh, hallways of our high schools, our classmates, our friends, our family. The loved ones we've lost to mental illness weigh heavily on our souls, and amidst that pain, the shock of these wounds has power. It has power to help us learn. We learn something about the power of mental illness, that that even with the best surrounding us, a loving support system of friends and family, the most skilled medical and psychological experts and institutions, that some illnesses are terminal. And more, we learn how vital it is to see those who suffer and not look away. We see them by breaking down stigmas, by talking openly with one another at home, by talking openly with one another in the synagogue instead of whispering behind our hands, by holding each other up with compassion and empathy. Let us here in Cleveland become a community where seeking help for mental illness or simply support for day-to-day stress is normal and not shameful. We live in a society where we fear conversations about mental health. This fear also pervades in our Jewish community, where our members can experience indifference, judgment, and shame. Some time ago, I had a conversation with a parent in our camp community. The parent shared with me how their teen would be moving out of state for a school of treatment and how humiliating this was for the family. They hadn't told anyone outside of their family. I responded, I want you to know that you're not alone. There are other families in this situation. I just talked to someone a week before. She said, that's just it. We all feel that we are alone. I've tried walking into our synagogues, and I turn away. I can't be there. I can't even reimagine re-enrolling them at camp. I'm afraid of the whispers and the judgments they might receive at their friends. These feelings are valid. We struggle to normalize mental illness and all sorts of things that differentiate us from one another. And the conversation surrounding the upkeep of mental health is hard to have. We can begin to change this paradigm by placing mental health alongside all of the other awesome complexities of human health. As our healing prayer, the Misha Beirach, reminds us we ask God to help us restore a fullness of body and spirit. As one study explains, everybody has mental health, just as we have physical health. Exercise is a way of maintaining our physical health. So is seeing a doctor, or going to the dentist, or eating healthy foods. These actions, though, are familiar to us. We discuss them at the dinner table, on social media, at the office. Maintaining mental health requires a different set of habits and expertise. Getting enough rest, practicing meditation, taking time outdoors, but seeing a therapist or a psychiatrist, even still after our pandemic, it's hard to talk about. Should that be the case? Half of us will experience a mental illness in our lifetime, just as many of us will endure physical illnesses like cancer or heart disease, too. Unexpected events impact our mental well-being for a period of time, not like a season-ending sports injury. Consider the grief for a moment that follows the death of a loved one. We struggle with this trauma and process it through the stages of ups and downs that are different for each of us, through personal growth, through adaptation and memory. And along the path, there are days where we believe we'll never recover from that grief, and other days where our swollen emotions subside and we're able to carry forward we can begin to change negative perceptions about mental illness and emotional distress by advocating in our schools, in our synagogues, in our camp communities, in our institutions, in the Jewish community, for access to caring professionals, and by working to increase openness and inclusion about personal differences, acceptance of gender diversity, of neurodiversity, of ADHD, autism, and all sorts of diagnoses. That is where we start. Communities become even better sources of compassion when their volunteer and professional leaders name and talk about the issue of mental well-being as part of our lived human experience rather than ignoring it or allowing it to become something only discussed in a clergy office or a guidance counselor office. 
One significant change over the last number of years, a number of years, has been the way that social media, YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, other online communities, sometimes they create a safe and affirming space for people to be able to share their stories. They receive the support of friends, and they feel seen in positive ways by a host of others. Not every story is one of success, but there is promise. In the Talmud, Tractate Berachot 5b, it guides us on the importance of what it means to be seen in our struggles. Through a series of accounts of our sages who lift one another up from bouts of depression, one scene opens as a man named Rabbi Yochanan finds his student in the corner of the room, suffering and afflicted with depression. Rabbi Yochanan walks over and sits with him. He asks if he wants to be ill. The student responds, I welcome neither this suffering nor its reward. Then Rabbi Yochanan asks for the student's hand and lifts him up. It seems very straightforward. The teacher comes in to help. But soon Rabbi Yochanan himself falls ill. Rabbi Hanina comes to him and asks Yochanan if he wants to be ill. He too responds, I welcome neither this suffering nor its reward. Rabbi Hanina says, give me your hand. Yochanan reaches out. Hanina lifts him up, restoring him to health. The Talmud poses a logical question here. If Rabbi Yochanan had the power to lift up and heal his student from depression, why wasn't he able to lift himself up and cure his own ailment? Why did he need Hanina's help too? To this, the Talmud powerfully answers, a prisoner cannot free himself from prison, but depends on others to release him from the shackles. Some of us who have experienced a mental illness know what it feels like to be blamed for our condition, to have difficulties with our friends or school communities or camp communities as a result. Why doesn't she get some help, someone might say. If he would only get better, he would get out of bed. No wonder we think twice before asking a supervisor or a teacher or a counselor for a mental health day. Blaming doesn't help someone who's suffering. Instead, we can listen more and avoid just giving unsolicited advice. We can be respectful of differences and be present with others. We carry the keys to release each other from isolation and shame and despair of mental illness. Over the years, the Jewish community has begun to open the door to this type of support through leaders like Pamela Schuler, who will visit here at Temple Tefereth Israel and teach in our teen program this year. Pam is a campmate of mine who grew up at the Goldman Union Camp Institute, where she, at the time, was a young girl experiencing Tourette's syndrome. Now she's a stand-up comedian, a national star, and teaches about youth mental health. We also have the support here in Cleveland of Belfair's Wingspan Care Group and youth groups like BBYO and Nifty that have put teen mental well-being forward as a priority. The Foundation for Jewish Camp has invested in camps across our country and our movements, giving them mental health counselors and helping us prioritize care as a top point of our program. While this work has brought success, it will take all of us to be able to change this culture, to confront today's stigmas and feelings of shame. We will see change when our instinct is to know the person for who they are and not just know them for their diagnosis. We will see change when we're comfortable and not ashamed to ask someone for help. We will see change when we start to view those who are struggling with mental illness as survivors rather than as victims. Over the last century, the Jewish community has traversed a long and painful path from many terrors, including that of the Shoah, to an era of vibrant American Jewry and a thriving state of Israel. In the early years, the Shoah's trauma on individuals was something many survivors buried beneath thick, painful layers of memory. For at least a generation, and especially early on in the state of Israel, we viewed the Shoah survivors as unsuspecting victims as sheep who had been led, as people who couldn't free themselves. We've learned, and we know, that this was the wrong response. 
Such a critique is far from the kavod, the honor that we bestow upon survivors, those who still exist today. For decades now, we've treated Shoah survivors as revered teachers of our community. We've helped them tell their story. People who suffer from mental illness or struggle with unexpected trauma experience great pain and anguish. They, too, are survivors, struggling to live with perceived insurmountable and pervasive threats to their well-being. We are, when we are actively present with one another, when we're present with others in our struggles, we help them to unlock the shackles of isolation, shame, and despair. If I could go back today to the intersection of Pico and Shenandoah in California, I hope I would make a different choice. I hope I wouldn't wait four years of the six that I lived there to learn Kate's name. I would try to learn her story. I would work to confront my own fear. I would find a way to see if she wanted help, or I would just try to listen. On this day of beginning, this day of Rosh Hashanah, a day of turning and a day of reckoning, the gates are now open. The next 10 days we walk through an alphabet of woe. It can be difficult and painful and tearful at times. But our shame is tempered by the presence of those around us in this community, each of us going through our journey of tshuva together. The spiritual openness we allow ourselves on this day holds power to help us see each other the rest of the year. Our tshuva will feel complete when we become more compassionate towards those in need, more vulnerable with one another about our own suffering. We change our culture when we care for mental health with the same respect that we have for physical health. We create more holy communities when we take notice of those who suffer, when we see rather than judge. We honor the survivors of mental illness sitting next to us when individuals and families no longer feel alone in their struggle. And we begin to bear the loss of our sons and daughters, our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our friends who have died from this illness. When their testimonies teach us to speak openly and honestly, when their legacies inspire us to build systems of support for mental well-being into everyday fabric in our communities, schools, synagogues, and homes. The gates are open. We pray that God's hand will open to us. May we do so for another year of blessing, of health, and of peace. Amen.